Now, we've all heard John 316 for our entire lives. Remember the guy at the end zone at the football games always has John 316 there. And every good little boy and good little girl have it memorized. But do you know what it has to do with a serpent on a stick? Now, you're going to hear the rest of the story. You're having coffee with Conrad on. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. My passion is for you to develop a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Did I say biblical? Yes, I did. Jesus said things that were pretty much, well, biblical. And sometimes we need to dive into the context. What did Jesus really mean? We are happy coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks.net. Jesus rules! Okay, so today you'll probably, maybe, possibly learn something about John 3.16 that was never taught in school, never taught in church. But here is what most people think that John 3.16 means. God loves the world so much that he gave Jesus to rescue it. But today, we're going to look at a couple of words that are in John 3.16 that are often glazed over in this King James passage. Those words are for, which kicks off the verse, and also the word so. Because of our focus upon these words, Once we focus on the original intent of the author, which is Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2, we may just learn what he meant when he uttered that phrase. And we will see a contrast between what Jesus meant and the popular, somewhat universalist type doctrine that's being used today. Now, I remember. The first time I ever heard John 3.16, I was in the first grade. There was a girl there. Her name was Kathy, and she was beaming ear to ear with a smile because she memorized a Bible verse. She quoted, and she was just really excited. I cannot emphasize that enough. She, She said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3.16. Now, I guess she was probably five or six years old, too, and she was so proud that she nailed that verse. I think that's the first time I ever heard of it. The point that I'm making here is that a six-year-old can memorize Scripture. Now, I think it's interesting that, you know, if you want to be a rabbi, if memory serves correct, you start memorizing the Torah, at six years old. They don't start out with John 3.16. They start out with Leviticus. But taking this story even further, I want you to let it sink in that Saul, you know, who we call Saul Paul in in the book of Acts, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which was like a top theologian PhD at the time. And Paul, Saul, Paul, not only had the Torah memorized, but when we read his scriptures now, we can see that he had large parts of the whole Old Testament memorized. He spread the gospel with only Old Testament scriptures. Could you do that? And keep in mind, though, that even though he had scripture practically memorized, the the Torah and the Tanakh, he was persecuting and killing Christians. Okay, Let that sink in for a bit. Slow down and chew on it. Saul practically had the Bible, the Old Testament, memorized. However, he was killing Christians using Scripture that he memorized as his authority. Now, it sounds like Paul might not have known the author of that Scripture at that point. See, this is why my passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the author of the scriptures that we read. Maybe Paul was sincere, 
sincerely zealous about Scripture. But maybe he was sincerely wrong until he met the author. Paul met the author and finisher of our faith on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Now, then we see, if we read Galatians, he had to basically unlearn all of that and sit at the feet of Jesus, which was, you know, this was post-cross, so this was a spiritual thing going on. And he learned from the Lord Jesus Christ directly. So this goes to show that if even if you memorize vast quantities of Scripture, that that's not salvation. Although hiding the word in our heart is highly profitable in the long run. You are having coffee with Conrad on ConradRocks.net. Understanding what our teachers tell us about Scripture sounds like a good idea, and I guess it often is. But keep in mind that Paul not only memorized the Scripture, and he was using that to kill Christians and persecute Christians, but he was doing that because of his understanding and his interpretation of that Scripture. So I want to submit to you that if Paul, who had a zeal for God, he had a zeal for God. If Paul can kill Christians using Scripture as his authority and in his zeal for God to do so, you and I can make mistakes too. The difference there in Paul's life was the Spirit. And the Spirit breathes the Scripture. The Spirit authored the text that he was zealous to memorize. The reason I mention the Spirit here is that understanding Scripture is not just a mental, carnal exercise. We have to be taught by the Spirit of Truth, which will guide us into all truth. The Spirit of Truth is what quickens the Word for us when we read it. Now, we know that Paul was not being led by the Spirit of Truth when he was persecuting Christians, but he was being led by his carnal interpretation of Scripture. The top theologians were teaching him. They were popular. They were highly esteemed. Paul was following what Gamaliel and Caiaphas and people like that were teaching, not what the Spirit of God was teaching. So we can fall into that same trap if we're not wary. Sometimes when I would read a passage in the Bible, in the Bible, or in a popular Christian book, or in an unpopular Christian book, there would be this struggle between the Spirit and my theology, the Spirit and my presuppositions. The Spirit would struggle with my carnal reasoning. Things that I would presuppose would block what the Spirit was trying to lead me towards. This is why we need to yield to the Spirit and verify it with the Word of God, because the Spirit and the Word agree. Now, we can memorize John 3.16 all we want. We can say it in 14 different languages. It doesn't really matter. But if we don't understand it, which means to stand of the conviction and weight of, what good is it? Well, the Word of God does not return void, and that's an interesting exercise to think about. So when we quote John 3.16 to someone, and we don't even know what John 3.16 means, it still may change a life. When we utter the words, the connotation of what we think it means is not necessarily conveyed or carried along to the listener. And God, you know, it, it, you know, we may utter the words across the airways of our communication, not understanding what it meant, but the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, can take that word anyway and sow it into the ears of the hearer and do a mighty work. The Word of God will not return void. It's not what we believe the Word of God says. It's the Word of God will not return void. So, in this podcast... I'm trying to prick your ear to a possibly different meaning than the popular one that you may believe now. 
So let's take a look at a couple of words that we have in our King James translation. The words are for and so. As a thank you for listening, I'm giving you a free trial of an audiobook and ebook subscription service if you haven't tried them before. You can try Scribd for free for two months with my link in the show notes. Scribd is an unlimited ebook and audiobook service. Think of it like Netflix for ebooks and audiobooks. I'm also giving you a special link to Audible, which has a great selection of audiobooks, and you get two audiobooks of your choice that you can keep forever, even if you cancel. The links will be in the show notes. Thank you for listening. Now, you may notice that the very beginning of John 3.16 starts with the three-letter word for in our English King James translation. Now, let me ask you a question. How often do you begin a sentence, not continue, but begin one, with the word for? I would be willing to bet never. This is because for signifies a continuation of thought. We could think of it as the same word as therefore. And when we see the word therefore, we need to see what it is there for. In the Greek, in the Strong's, it's the Greek 1063. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's gar, maybe. A primary particle properly assigning a reason used in argument, explanation, or intensification often with other particles, and, comma, as, comma, because, that, comma, but, comma, even, comma, for, indeed, comma, no doubt, comma, seeing, then, comma, therefore, comma, it continues on. But basically the idea is it's a continuation of a thought. So to put this in context, we need to back up a few verses and see what our Lord and Savior, the author and finisher of our faith, was referring to before John 3.16. Here's the passage. I'm going to read John 3.10 through 15. And as I'm reading this, remember that this is what that for is for. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall ye believe? If I tell you of heavenly things, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, I read a lot more than I wanted to because I didn't want to start with the word and, (laughs) because one of the verses in there starts with the word and, and I like go, well, I'm going to have to go through setting us up in context too. But you'll notice that Jesus talks about believing on him in verse 15. But what it's there for, he's saying this, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So think about the four. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about being born again, And then he talks about how Jesus is in heaven and came down from heaven. That's something that seems to be outside the realm of physics when you think about it. He came down from heaven and is in heaven. Our three- or four-dimensional reality doesn't really understand that. But here he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, if you're not really familiar with the account that Jesus is referring to with Moses, the children of Israel sinned. They were murmuring against God. So, you know, don't murmur. God doesn't like it. And he, God sent serpents among them. They were getting hammered by these snakes, and they were dying. So they put two and two together, 
and they go, you know, God sent us snakes because we sinned. And they cried out in repentance and sincerity. And then God, you know, makes a way of escape, right? God instructed Moses to make a brass serpent on a pole. Now think of the crucifixion of Jesus, right? And whenever someone that was bitten by the serpent looked up to the serpent, they had to look to the serpent. They couldn't look to the left. They couldn't look to the right. They had to look to the serpent on the stick. They were healed. And this is why we see the serpent on the stick as our medical symbol today. So Jesus is saying that he's supposed to be lifted up on a stick, which would mean the cross. Do I need to spell that out, really? And it would, the people confessed sincerely and repented and looked toward Jesus, they would get eternal life. Now that's covering the word for. Now what about the word so? Now, going back to my first grade experience with Kathy, quoting her memorized verse of John 3.16, beaming ear to ear, she used the word so, because it's in there. It's the English word. Now, we can think of John 3.16 when we isolate the verse all by itself, out of context. We can say the word so and say God so loved the world, like he magnanimously loved the world so much that he did something awesome. Kind of interesting that God tells us to love not the world nor the things in it. Jesus chose us out of the world. If the world hates us, then it hated him first. Loving the world is something that we are instructed not to do. So there may be some cognitive dissonance here when we read or hear that passage. And we, can, we need to discern that there's a distinct difference between the world and the people of God. So if we dig into the Greek and understand that King James was originally translated in 1611, we can see that maybe the word so doesn't mean today what it meant in 1611. Words can change over time. If you listen to my podcast, I complain about this a lot, right? You'll see that I highlight from time to time that the word cool, it used to mean not hot, right? Now it means intriguing. Or now the kids are calling something cool sick. Go figure. Sick used to mean not healthy. Now it means cool, which means intriguing. Or why do birds sing so gay? (laughs) Gay used to mean happy. So these are words that changed in our generation. So we need to understand that when we read the Bible. This is why we need to go to the original inspired autographs from time to time and See what what the original text meant. The word so in Greek is Greek 3779 in the Strong's. Hutu, I guess. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. In this way, referring to what precedes or follows. After that, after in, this manner, as even, so, for all that, likewise, no more, on this fashion. So you see that it means in this manner or after that, or likewise. So notice that in this definition, it does not in any way allude to God loving the world in such a magnanimous manner at all. In the Strong's, there's nothing like that in the original Greek. But it says, in this way, or in this manner, So that's what so means, in this way or in this manner. So this brings us to the idea that Jesus is seriously alluding to the account. He's looking back at what he just said of the serpent on the pole. It isn't 
that Jesus is saying the magnanimous love of God that he's referring to, but he's referring to the fact that the people in the world who are stung by the serpents of sin, they can look up to Jesus like the Israelites looked to the serpent on the cross, and they'll get eternal life and not perish. Yes, God may love the world in a great magnanimous manner. God is long-suffering. He's patient. Thank God for that. He's not willing that any should perish. And he sent his son to die a brutal, hideous death for me and you. But we have to appropriate the work. We've got to look at the pole, like the Israelites. Knowing that information didn't save them. They had to look, actually look at the serpent on the pole. We need to appropriate that. We acknowledge that Jesus died for us, and then we need to look to his work on the cross in like manner as the children of Israel look to the serpent on the stick in like manner. What if we consider what Jesus did as a common thing and didn't regard it? What happens to those people? So in conclusion here, words mean something. It can be the difference between life and death. What we utter in our hearts will be where we stand or fall. I was present when someone was led in the sinner's prayer. And a month later, I talked to them about Jesus. And they said, I can't believe in Jesus. I'm Jewish. And I said, well, why did you bother to say the sinner's prayer? He said that that was to get the evangelist to shut up. This actually happens more often than you would think. I knew another person that said the sinner's prayer. And a few months later, I ran into them at Denny's and they were wearing a Muslim outfit. When they were questioned, they said, oh, I decided to become a Muslim. The point is, they uttered the words, but Jesus wasn't in their hearts. When we utter the words, John 3.16, we need Jesus in our hearts. This is talked about in the Sower of the Word parable. In Mark 4, and also Matthew 13, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. So we need to do more than just memorize John 3.16. We need Jesus in our hearts. Amen? If this podcast has touched you, please let me know. Remember the word fist. Fist is F-I-S-T. F is for Facebook. Follow me on Facebook. I get a lot of my shows and interact with a lot of my listeners on my Facebook personal account. You can get in on a lot of the conversations over there as well. I is for Instagram. I often post spirit-led revelations to my Instagram story throughout the day. S is for subscribe. Wherever you're listening to your podcast, whether it be Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, please subscribe and maybe even rate, like, and comment wherever that is. T is for Twitter. You may find that I rant a little on Twitter, and I'll often take polls to see what's going on with, with my followers. But it's also a place where I get show content. So follow me on Twitter. All these links will be in the show notes. I want to thank you for being in my life. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.